the French Broad Food Co-op, a grocery store focusing more on people than profit by providing living wages, supporting local farmers, and being community owned. Citizens have a voice in how the co-op functions. Everyone can shop from anywhere in Durham. together that eventually ended up being smokers for most people's grills, I think. Um, but after a career up in D.C. dealing with some pretty cranky people all day, every day, I realized I wanted to do something that I could work with happy people and make people happy. Um, and ice cream just seemed a natural way to do that. You know, everybody loves it. I've loved it since I was a kid, fond memories. So it was a, kind of a natural progression for me. Now, you mentioned those air fresheners. How old were you then? Uh, Six, seven years old. <laughs> do, you, do you still have them? No, 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 no. They're long gone, I'm afraid. <laughs> because I'm thinking that that'd be kind of cool. We could also sell them, you know, put them, <laughs> put them on the side to the ice cream. Hey, by the way, did you get your air fresh now? <laughs> yeah, or, yeah. or something? Yeah, little pieces of construction paper with <laughs> nuts that fell out of trees glued to them. But people loved them when I was a kid. So you mentioned as a kid you, you always liked ice cream. Mm -hmm. What was the, do you remember, I remember kind of one of my first experiences at a Baskin Robbins, even maybe before then at a Baskin Robbins. Mm -hmm. Do you remember your first experiences with ice cream? Well, the one that I always hearken back to, you know, I couldn't tell you where it was, um, but it was a long day uh, out in the woods with my dad. We'd been out chopping wood uh, to heat the house. And afterwards he took me out somewhere and we just got a classic dip cone you know vanilla ice cream with the hard shell chocolate dip and i remember it melting over my hands in the back of the van you know surrounded by sawdust and debris from all the work we'd been doing and that just being you know one of those polarizing moments of oh this is great because it was it was such a treat you know i don't remember us having ever done that before i was probably seven or eight years old for that and this was also in the middle of the winter, or yeah. was, was it? <laughs> yep, it was uh, probably December, so not too far of this time of year. And that's kind of a cool, th a cool thing. It really is a cool thing about ice cream, but you can eat it all year round. It's okay to eat it in the winter? Absolutely. <laughs> Believe it or not, in a lot of states, uh, the per capita sales for ice cream go up in the winter. Is it really? Mm -hmm. Well, I imagine Florida maybe. No, but, <laughs> but other places really? Yeah, um, Alaska is the classic example. Um, they sell more ice cream than most states. Uh, despite the the coldness year round, even up there. Well, you were telling me something interesting off the air, and just I never thought about it. But one of the cool things about frostbites is you're always trying, I think, different things. Oh, okay. Yeah. And I remember I saw the first time this sign. I, I couldn't get it. We sell ice cream and 
French fries or something. <laughs> How did you get into the French fry business? Well, I've uh, been looking for something to add to the menu that was warm. You know, we've got a couple of warm things like funnel cakes and other treats like that, but wanted something on the savory side rather than just straight sweet. And something that I remember seeing uh, in, you know, previous life, as it will, is people dipping fries into a shake and said, huh, well, that sounds pretty good. So I went and tried it for myself and said, okay. Wait, you you never had that before? Not not for a long time. You know, right. probably stole one from the neighbor kids back when. But, um, you know, the mix of the, the salty and the sweet and the hot and the cold um, just was really appealing. So I started experimenting, you know, finding, you know, what's the right cut and the right way to season the fries and how can we make them, you know, the best possible so that they're, you know, thick enough to dip into a, a heavy shake and come out in one piece with a nice little scoop of ice cream with it. And it does well? Oh, they do great. I, I just can't see it, but I guess I'll have to try yeah, it. Yeah, you've got to come down and try one. I'll take care of it. In a shake. And very nutritious also. That, that oh, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. 100%. <laughs> well, you know, it's the, the bad thing about having you on board is I'm getting hungry now l- listening <laughs> to this. And, of course, you mentioned another thing. Who would have thunk, and I remember seeing it on the sign, you sell funnel cakes as well. Mm-hmm. What was the idea behind selling funnel cakes? I uh, had them when I, at a fair when I was a kid and have always loved them. And, I mean, you can't really go wrong with sweet fried pastry uh, covered in sugar. Um, and it's another thing that goes really well with ice cream. I mean, even at carnivals and whatnot, you'll often find them topped with a dollop of soft-serve ice cream or, you know, some strawberries or something else. So, you know, the, the original concept behind Frostbite was that you can go to the fair every day. Oh, I love so. What a great concept, isn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. so, so we do the cotton candy, we do the funnel cakes, all the th- kind of fun things you'd expect for treats at a carnival or something like that. I love it. I forgot. So you sell cotton candy, too? Mm-hmm. Do you sell a bunch of that, too? Um, I won't say we sell a ton of it, but, you know, we like to take it to events, and we'll do it as giveaways. Um, you know, we've got the machine up there at the shop and can pretty much make it any time. Uh, I think most people just kind of go... Ooh, ice cream. I want ice cream, you know. Forget, forget that cotton candy stuff. Well, at the shop, <laughs> so any time of the year, can you get cotton mm-hmm. kind of candy also? Yep. Well, and one of the nice things, of course, I'm going to put you on the spot here, Jason. Sure. But the funnel cake, you brought it with you today to <laughs> think about to me and the other guests? I wish I had. I wish I had. <laughs> Jason, I'll kill you next time. <laughs> next time. We'll, we'll get you on next board. Next time for sure. I want to tell my producer, Amy, book him next week. Yeah, yeah, all right. Just, just, just let me know. I'll cook him ca- up fresh. Funnel cake, too. <laughs> Talk about people... Uh, People are strange, I guess, so are ice cream owners as well. <laughs> what are some of those strange combinations you get people to, to request? Strange combinations. Like oh, um, in terms of even sh- or like shakes, you have how many different flavors of shakes? Well, we'll do a shake with any of our ice cream flavors, so anywhere between 12 and 20 different flavors, depending on the time of year. Um, and we'll also blend in any of our toppings. So I ran the math on it one time, and we've got something like 3,000 different possible shakes that we can do. Now, 90% of our shakes are something along the lines of chocolate and peanut butter um, or vanilla and Oreo, you know, the classic cookies and cream. But we get some people that come in and get really interestingly <laughs> creative with them. Um, Likewise. There, there's one family that comes in, and every time the guy gets the same order, and it's a large chocolate shake, and he puts peanut butter and Reese's. Okay, got me so right. far. <laughs> then he has gummy bears <laughs> and rainbow sprinkles in a shake. and M&M's. All blended into a shake. Wow. Yeah. So it's, you know, he's got to be scraping it out of there with a spoon, but it's got all the things that he loves in it, so we have to blend it up. Well, I like it, too. You know, it, it reminds me that other ice cream places or yoga places, you know, put in toppings. And so Cynthia, mm-hmm. my beautiful bride, it tells a story, went into one of those places, and it says, hey, just get $2 worth of yogurt. Mm-hmm. You know, but then got $17 worth of toppings. You <laughs> <Yep. know? laughs> so this guy, you know, you have a reasonable price for a shake, and all of a sudden he goes in. And, <laughs> Why is this costing me $12? <laughs> well, and, yeah, yeah. And, and so heavy, too. He doesn't have to go to the gym as, as a result, you mm-hmm. know, by oh, definitely. lifting up that shake. Well, you know, it's interesting, too. Ice cream has, wow, has it changed, even mm-hmm. since you have been in the business. Absolutely. When I was a kid, again, Howard Johnson's, right, was the classic then a little chocolate strawberry. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, something called Baskin Robbins opens up. <laughs> and I remember when it opened up in my town the first time, I was just amazed, you know. 33 flavors. Yet, cha- flavors change. And, and the most amazing one, and you do have it often, if not all the time, a salted caramel. Mm-hmm. You know, where'd that come from? You know, <laughs> as a kid, I love caramel. But it's only the last couple of years that everything is now salted caramel. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's been a very popular one for... Uh, Four or five years now. Um, you know, it's interesting to watch the flavor profiles that are popular change over time. You know, for a while, 
a couple of years back, Sriracha was in everything. And nowadays it's, you know, it's still around, but it's not nearly the popular force in food culture that it was. Um, you know, in the ice cream business, Nutella was huge for a right. long time. Um, and we have that as a topping and as an ice cream flavor, but its popularity this year relative to even two years ago has dropped off dramatically. Um, you know, salted caramel has been the, the pretty steady one. It's one of the reasons it's with the vanilla and chocolate, one of the flavors we always have. Um, and it's just, it's always fun to be on the lookout for, okay, well, what do you think the next great thing is going to be? What's the, what's the next flavor profile that is going to be popular for the long term um, and be the big thing for the next year or two? And salted caramel, I think, was interesting in the sense that it started out just caramel, which I love. Mm-hmm. And that was very popular. But then all of a sudden, I guess somebody had the idea to make it salted caramel. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Talk about your ice cream. Do you make it? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we make all of our flavors right there in-house. Uh, we get and, a, and, and, and we still our listeners. It's a big house, too. You know, it's not, it's a, <laughs> <laughs> I wish it was a little bigger, I will admit. How, uh, how we've big got, is it? We've got about 800 square feet. And so you have the storefront, and then you have the ice cream making in the back? Exactly. So in order to be able to fit everything into the space, we have a, a base blended up for us by a dairy. You know, there, there, it simply isn't room in that building for homogenization equipment. Right. Um, but take that just flavorless base, the milk, cream, and sugar blended together for us, and then we do all of the flavoring right there in-house. You know, for the vanilla, we're, we're taking the vanilla extract and blending it together in the right ratio. Chocolate, we've got the cocoa powder, um, you know, salted caramel, the, the salt and the caramel, you know, all blended in together right there. And then the machines we have allow us to freeze it fresh and on the spot as well. So it's it's the freshest ice cream you can get. Now, as an ice cream guy, I like that too. We'll call you Jason, the <laughs> ice, ice cream guy. Do you ever try, just sometimes get creative, or do you ever want to try something? Absolutely. I, I spend half my days most days experimenting with new flavors. Um, I've got a machine that you can't see in the back of the store um, that I encourage the staff to do the same thing. We're constantly back there fiddling around, trying new recipes, tweaking our current recipes, always figuring out what's going to be the best option, you know, because I I don't like serving something that isn't good enough. And one of the things also amazed me about your staff, and by the way, a compliment to you, I I find them very friendly, very, I mean, you just have a good time when you go in there and they're smiling and and having a good time. Mm -hmm. But I'm amazed your staff isn't all over 400 pounds, you know. (laughs) Like like my wife says, and and you've met Cynthia, you know, she said she could never work in an ice cream place Mm -hmm. because she'll be eating the the product all the time. (laughs) Is, Is that an occupational hazard? Well, yes and no. Um, (laughs) Believe it or not, I lost about 40 pounds opening up the shop. Right. Um, And a lot of the staff, you know, some of them will over snack for the first few weeks, but there's a lot of moving around in what we do. You know, we're not just kind of sitting behind a register waiting for somebody to come up and weigh their cup. You know, between taking the order, running around in the machine, cleaning things all the time, it's actually fairly physically demanding. Um, I mean, even just whisking the ice cream together. Uh, you know, we've got a joke around the shop about how everybody's forearms get these big whisking muscles. I can and we'll imagine. go and just kind of <laughs> well, <no, laughs> flex or, them around. Or do you tell, do staffers learn to scoop with both arms? <laughs> we try to. Um, when, we're, when we're pulling a cone, depending on how busy we are, especially in the heat of summer, there isn't room to necessarily get your preferred hand on the machine. <laughs> <laughs> so we do train everyone to be ambidextrous. I can imagine. That'd mm-hmm. be good. But, you know, you come up with an idea you didn't even think of. But we could have, um, like you said, Jason's uh, weight reduction plan, you know, <laughs> yeah. and work. And, and you wouldn't have to pay to, to join. Just work for me for two weeks, you yeah, know. And, that'll do and, it. <laughs> and uh, you know, you can try all the ice cream you want. And then after a couple of days, you'll give up that. I guess that's, that's what happens. <laughs> and then they just want to take a little sample or, mm-hmm. you know, as opposed to a whole big bite. Oh, just yeah. work for you for two weeks and lose weight. <laughs> or, <laughs> that'll do it. Or, you know, the guy who fell into... He's not in, in popular anymore, but the guy with um, Subway, you know, mm-hmm. that you could be. And wasn't was his name Jason, too? Uh, Jared. Jared, yeah. Yep. But you could be also, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, ho- hopefully with a better long-term reputation. <laughs> no, no, but I'm saying, but, but the ice cream diet, mm-hmm. you know, I lost 40 pounds, you know, <laughs> here before and after. Yeah, Just for sure. Frostbite ice cream, you know. That's amazing alcohol. what going from a desk job to running around on your feet all day every day will do. <laughs> Talk about ice cream, too, in terms of um, – the difference is, and, and then you sell ices also, mm-hmm. right? And we'll talk about that as well. So ice cream, naive question, but how do you go about making ice cream? Well, um, so... Well, I, what goes in it? So, I mean, obviously milk, cream, and sugar are the basis for everything. And, and milk, of course, is good for you. Mm-hmm. you know, it's, yeah, I, I like to tell everybody it's actually a very balanced diet. <laughs> um, believe it or not, Harvard Medical put out an article at the start of the summer saying that ice cream is one of the best breakfasts you can have. 
it's got the the fats and the protein and the sugar that you need to kind of get your metabolism up and running and started for the day. Especially put some almonds in it or some nuts. Or, <laughs> Ab- but wait, absolutely. Can I make a suggestion? Please. That article, I'd love to see it too. Mm-hmm. Send it to me if we'll you do. can dig it up. Yep. But you should have it. At, I've seen that in ice cream place. You should have that at the store. Where, not a bad or, idea. Where should also, if not at the store, just put it on the you know the register or something like that. <laughs> It was very serious. A, a friend of mine used to run a bagel shop and found some article, same kind of thing. It's good to eat a bagel a day, mm-hmm. but I'd really like to see that. Yeah. I think that could help you, you know, if, if parents or kids ask, you know, hey, it's good for me. Here's the article. <laughs> you know, but, but think about that. It might be an interesting giveaway. Mm-hmm. So I, I cut you off. So you're saying that it has all this balanced stuff. Yeah. So, you know, milk, cream, and sugar in the right ratios is very important. Um, you know, the, the butterfat content of ice cream makes a huge difference in its quality. It's one of the big things that sets us apart um, from other soft serve, especially in the area, is we use a, a much higher butterfat content. It gives it a much smoother, creamier mouthfeel and taste. Uh, so getting those ratios right and then balancing any kind of thickening agent, you know, the caramel we use, for example, thickens up the ice cream considerably. So we have to offset that, making sure we've got the right um, kind of viscosity to the base. Uh, getting all those pieces blended together and then frozen correctly. Uh, the big other thing that goes into ice cream that people don't think about is actually air. Um, another major difference is it's called overrun in the ice cream world. Uh, what percentage of air goes into any given batch of ice cream? Um, you know, you can take an ounce of ice cream mix and put it through a machine and it'll come out two inches tall if you don't have much air, or you can put an ounce in and it'll come out six inches tall, just depending on how much air you're beating into your product. How did you learn to make ice cream? Trial and error for the most part. Um, Once I realized I wanted to do ice cream, um, I talked with some other ice cream shops uh, up in North Virginia. There's a place called Nathan's Dairy Bar in Manassas. I was very fortunate to get to meet the owner and talk with him about some of his experience. And then lots and lots of research. Uh, Spent about two years planning and experimenting and then hit the ground running, just kind of trying and failing and learning as I went. So I remember when I first met you, I, I asked that question. You know, mm-hmm. there's a guy, business background, wanted to start a business, and, you know, had never run an ice cream shop. Mm-hmm. But I guess, like you said, just doing it kind of, you learn on, on the, Absolutely. on doing it. Yep. Too. Um, something we talked about off the air, to, I guess with any business, but in your case, more so being a seasonal business, mm-hmm. staffing can be a problematic, I imagine. Oh, yes. The, um, I mean, how do you find the formula? as to how many people you should have? Well, a lot of it is also that trial and error. You know, uh, the first year I was in business, I had way too many people. Um, You know, we were running four and five people on any given shift. When, you know, once we had the processes worked out and kind of the flow, uh, understanding how the business would operate uh, on a day-to-day basis a little better, can usually trim that down to, you know, three or in some cases even two people running the shop. Um, you know, staffing is always one of the major challenges, uh, especially as I mentioned, seasonal. Um, by the time you get somebody in and trained up and you're like, yes, this is a great person, they either have to go back to school um, or we look at the winter hours when we're open Friday, Saturday, Sunday instead of seven days a week and have to, you know, oftentimes make some pretty difficult decisions about, okay, well, I've got enough hours for these four people, but not for these other three. Um and one of the reasons that I make sure to stay open in the winter is so that I have the opportunity to keep some of my staff. You know, I like being able to keep people employed year-round rather than saying, okay, that's nice. Come back in four months. Thanks. <laughs> I'll give you a compliment also, and, and, you know, I've talked about this, but you're one of the few businesses I know that don't send people home, mm-hmm. you know, that um, I imagine, like you said, first of all, every day in, in the morning, are you listening to the weather or you know, the night before? <laughs> you better believe it. And, and you pray, you know, mm-hmm. or, or, or something. Ice cream, I guess, or ideally you have warm weather or Thanksgiving mm-hmm. or whatever. But explain how you, you do that, which I, I think it's really great that you, you don't send people home. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, weather makes a big factor in any service industry business, um, for us especially. But, you know, the policy at the store is if you're scheduled for a shift, you get to work. Um, so what we'll do is, you know, everybody comes in and if it's pouring rain or surprise, we get two inches of snow on the ground, you know, we'll give staff the option of going home, but I don't mandate that anybody goes home because it's not fair to take a paycheck away from somebody that's depending on it simply for the sake of saving a few cents on the bottom line. That's just not how I choose to operate. And I really give you credit for that because a lot of other places, not just in the ice cream business, but 
just in business in general. If it's slow, they just send people home. Mm -hmm. And I like it. It's interesting. You said you give people the option. Do some people choose to go home? Yes, yes. Or not come in, I guess? Mm -hmm. like, so the it's not often, um, but especially, you know, for the staff I have that are students, you know, it can be a chance for them to work on schoolwork or projects they wouldn't otherwise have been able to. Um, you know, the, the I call it the one exception. The one time I have sent people home is when we have – what I'll consider any kind of safety issue. So if the roads start icing up or it's looking like it might be hazardous to travel, I, I'll actually shut down the shop to send people home because I'd rather my team be safe. Now, also, again, too, just to tell folks, so in the winter, Frostbite, I should mention, where is Frostbite? Ah, it's at 1475 Patton Avenue, which is in West Asheville, uh, right in front of Skylane's Bowling Alley. Okay, and great signage, by the way. You're, you. you're driving <laughs> down, you'll see Frostbite. You know, it's, it's really cool. And so ordinarily... Your hours are what? Uh, normally, we are noon to 10. Um, and for the winter, it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, in the fall and spring, we'll do Wednesday through Sunday. Uh, but for most of the year, we're seven days a week, noon to 10. Okay. And then you also mentioned to me off the air that, which makes sense to me, that during the holiday season, you close down? Uh, yes. Uh, we close down for three major holidays the weekend of. Uh, so Thanksgiving, so this weekend will be closed. Uh, and then Christmas and New Year's, we do a, a two-week-long gap for everybody to be able to spend time with family. Okay, which is kind of nice, and, and I guess mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily the big sales for, for, for sure. ice cream or something. So wait, I'm out of luck then. I mean, if I, after I go, go back, we, we pass it, oh, we start going back. I can't get my ice cream today. <laughs> when, uh, I'm afraid Wednesday so. Wednesday and Thanksgiving. <laughs> uh -oh. So that's yeah. why you, that's the excuse for not bringing in the funnel cake. You yeah. know, we're closed down. <laughs> we're closed the, today. The, the, yeah. shop, the shop was closed or, mm -hmm. or something. But we'll be back next Friday, not to worry. Okay, thanks. <laughs> Save up my um, ice cream fix. Talk <laughs> to me also about how you chose Asheville. In other words, you're from where originally? Well, I've moved around a lot. Um, I tell people I'm from Atlanta. That's where my family has uh, lived most recently. Uh, I went to school up in Virginia and then kind of spent my career in the D.C. area. So I spent about a decade up there. It's probably more accurate where I'm from versus where my family's from. Um, and then I came to Asheville on a trip eight years ago now um, and just fell in love with the town um, and took a look around and decided I want to live there. I want to be a part of that community. So did the planning, wrapped up my affairs up there, and here I am. And again, to your credit, I think, that I remember when I first met you, it must have been six, eight years ago, whatever, mm -hmm. and you came into school and just talking about an idea, that you really did a lot of research on this before you jumped mm -hmm. in. I mean, you didn't go, just go right into it. It took you, <laughs> what, about two, hour, two years to open it? Yeah, about two years' worth of uh, planning, site selection, uh, getting all the ducks in a row. I don't like jumping into anything half-baked. And I think your credit you got you really caught almost a perfect location that just seems mm -hmm. like a really good location because both directions there's not a lot of you know <laughs> there's not a lot of soft serve ice cream mm -hmm. first of all it just an, it seems a, a good location for you yeah it's a it's a great spot you know i spent about six months actually looking at different locations around town you know south north east west all over the place um there was a couple of factors i knew i wanted to have and a couple i knew i was hoping to have and got lucky with almost everything in this spot. You know, we've got a drive through We've got parking, which, as you know, is nigh impossible to find in this town. Um, and, you know, enough space to do what we want to. And, like I said, very easy to get in and out of mm -hmm. a place. drive through what Paul Park, what percentage of people use the drive through It's about a third of our business. Is it really? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we probably sell more shakes and funnel cakes through drive through than anything else. Um I think probably just because they're very easy to hold while you're driving. You know, we want people to be safe, of course. But, you know, it, it's great if somebody's really tired or if they've got a kid that's finally managed to fall asleep in the back seat, uh, but they still need, you know, either a coffee or just something to do a little quick pickup. Um, so it's, it, it's always great seeing people come around that way. One of the things also that I think uh, makes Frostbite stand out is you also try to be active in the community. Definitely. And let's talk a little bit about that, because I guess that's part of your vision to get involved in your local community. Absolutely. I mean, it's that that's what Asheville is all about, is the community. Um, so I do everything I can to, you know, slowly and little uh, selectively uh, get involved in charities in the area um, or be able to be a part of what's going on around town. I mean, anything from... You know, sponsoring a little league team last year to we did a uh, hurricane relief drive um, when we had uh, 
well, quite a few of them over the last two years, it feels yeah. like. <laughs> um, just making sure that we support where we can and what we can. The um, Moving forward, uh, so you've been in Frostbite this location now. By the way, belated congratulations. Thank you it's, very much. Um, what is it? Yesterday marks three years you've yep. been in the Yesterday location. was the third anniversary. Very exciting <laughs> stuff. Yep. Who would have thunk? You oh, know? boy. <laughs> it's been a crazy ride, but loved every minute of it. And by the way, that comes across, too, that, that you really seem to have fun with this, do mm -hmm. you? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the whole point of everything, isn't it? Um, if you're not enjoying what you're doing, you need to make a change. Uh. And can you imagine, especially getting ice cream, that um, if people came in and they weren't greeted by somebody who's having fun or, or <laughs> having a good time. Another question I always wonder about, not so much your place, but other places. If people come in, can they get a sample? Absolutely. Okay, before they make a decision. Mm -hmm. Now the question, Jason, do you ever have to cut somebody off it's like a bartender <laughs> what what's the most anybody ever asked i have cut one person off ever from <laughs> samples uh and that was on their ninth <laughs> I, out of 12 flavors they had sampled nine of them and i said all right en enough is enough are you <laughs> kidding me <laughs> yeah you need to make yeah. a decision oh my goodness <laughs> now the question that nine did they order something they did they did oh. But nine, most people mm -hmm. say three, you know. Yeah, most people do one, two, you know, occasionally we'll get three. This was uh, definitely an outlier. <laughs> <laughs> get out. And yep. Yeah, and I mean, of course, you don't like doing that. You know, it's not part of uh, who and what we are. Um, but by the same token, you know, by the time you got ten people stacked up in a line behind you, you know, step to the side until you're ready to order and then come back. <laughs> and you would think they'd be able to make determination after a, a few flavors. The problem is they're all delicious. <laughs> <laughs> Talk, uh, spoken like a true ice cream guy, <laughs> Jason, the ice cream guy. What's uh, your favorite flavor? Oh, uh, so butter pecan is probably my favorite one that we've always got around. Yeah. Um, but this past weekend, we did my overall favorite one, which is the apple cider, uh, oh, which I unfortunately I only that. get to make uh, once a year, but it was, it's wonderful. <laughs> oh, that's, now you got me tempted. Mm -hmm. uh, next week will it be on or...? or? Uh, we used up the last of it this weekend, so next week we're actually going to bring back eggnog for the season, which is another one that's quite delicious. And one of my least favorites, so oh, I'll, okay. I'll pass on that. <laughs> don't worry. We'll have cappuccino back soon, though. Okay. Do you ever have um, ice cream flavors that don't sell, or do you, do you eventually do you get rid of everything you sell? Uh, we have some that are less popular than others. Um, you know, coconut, for example, it's a very polarizing flavor. People either love it or really don't like it. Um, I, I love coconut, but yeah, I don't recall seeing that a lot there. Yeah, we don't go through it often because it's so polarized. Is it really? Mm -hmm. um, it, it you know, the me. people that want it, want it. <laughs> Same kind of thing. Um, oh, here's another flavor, but it reminds me of um, pizza, you know, Hawaiian mm -hmm. surprise pizza, my all-time favorite is mm -hmm. with Canadian bacon and pineapple, pineapple. but very polarizing, <laughs> you know? A lot, of, a lot of people say it's not a purist. Pineapple I haven't seen. Do you have, ever have pineapple? We do, we do. Yep, we've done that. Um, we do pina colada more often than yeah, straight right. pineapple. Um, in large part because we have pineapple as one of our toppings. So we can always make, you know, pineapple shake or simply, you know, pineapple over vanilla ice cream. Oh, so, so, because I'm really tempted now. I love <laughs> pineapple shake. I haven't had it for years. Oh, we make very good pineapple shakes. And you also, you were telling me, and I know it, even though I never get it, off to the left you have ices. Mm -hmm. And what's that all about? So, I mean, it's basically, it's shaved ice. So we got about 40 flavors. Uh, a lot of people come in and they're like, oh, I'm not, what's a, what's a shaved ice? The easiest way to describe it is it's a snow cone. Snow cone, yeah. um, But the ice, we have an actual adjustable shaver. So we can do everything from the fine powdered snow that people from Hawaii and Florida are kind of expecting to the crunchier texture that people from the Northeast seem to be familiar with. Um, uh, we'll do three flavors uh, in your ice, and we've uh, added sour spray this year as well, so we can do the nice tart citric to go with it Wait, as well. People can make with three flavors? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And do they? Most do. <laughs> yeah. It's very unusual where we'll get a single flavor one. Like what would be a combination? I never thought of that. Uh, a lot of people do the, the red, white, and blue. Um, so you get your strawberry or your watermelon, uh, your blue raspberry, and your coconut. Uh, it's probably wow. the, the combination we sell the most of. So like the ice cream now, you're getting me tempted to have, have the ice <laughs> as, as well. What do you see in the future for Frostbite? Where are you going? Well, it's going a lot of different ways right now. Um, I want to do more in the community, um, start being able to go to events and join in on things. You know, there's a lot of wonderful art festivals that I'd love to be a part of. Uh, we're always on the lookout for a potential second location. Um, and in the meantime, just tweaking a look at what we can add to the menu, what we can tweak, what we can make better. So I'm always interested in suggestions for what people would like to see us have. 
Uh, that's, you know, we added the fries this year. Those have been a big hit. You know, what, what's next? What are people interested in seeing? Interesting. If folks want to get more information about Frostbite, mm -hmm. best bet is to what? Uh, our Facebook page is probably the most commonly updated spot. We do have a website, frostbiteicecream.com. Um, you can always email me, uh, info at frostbiteicecream.com. Um, but, you know, Facebook and Instagram are probably the best places to keep an eye on what we're doing. Okay, and again, encourage people to get a frostbite. Um, you got my site, me site. I just can't go there now. <laughs> or I can go, I can wave and you know, pass it. <laughs> you can we'll wave us. Come by next weekend. Jason, as always, a pleasure seeing you, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon at Frostbite. Thanks very much, Blaine. I appreciate it, and happy Thanksgiving. You too, buddy. Okay, as Jason works his way out of the station, I'd like to mention that underwriter support for WPVM is made possible by Goodwill of Western North Carolina. Goodwill creates opportunities for people to enhance their lives by training, workforce development services, and collaboration with community organizations. More information on the web at Goodwill of Western North Carolina. I'd now like to recognize some upcoming theater productions that will be happening in the Asheville area. And um, f first one I'm looking forward to seeing something next week is Nuncrackers at Hendersonville Community Theater. Show's annual Christmas program put out by the nuns at Mount, Mount, Mount St. Helens. And uh, again, if you've never seen it, it's certainly something for you to uh, check out. I think you'd have a lot of fun with it. For information and tickets, please click um, HendersonvilleTheater.org, theater spelled the correct way, R-E, I contend. In addition, um, Asheville Buncombe Community Christian Ministry marks the 32nd year of North Carolina's longest-running nativity pro production, Return to Bethlehem, December 6th and 9th at Grace United Methodist Church on Tunnel Road in Asheville. For more information, that's at abccm.org. It's now my pleasure to, to um, introduce to you two of my favorite theater folks, and they are Jennifer Memlo, is that how you pronounce it? Correct. Memlo and Jonathan Forrester, is that how you pronounce that? Yes. Jonathan, move a little bit closer to the mic, I think, and we'll get you going a little bit. That'd sure. be great. And um, I should mention that uh, Jennifer Memlo is an actress, uh, and Jonathan Forrester is the director, both at Brevard Little Theater, for a production we'll be talking about in just a second, The Lion in Winter. And um, Jennifer is also an American Dramatic Academy of Dramatic Arts trained actress. She's only recently returned to acting, good for us, or lucky for us. She, she is acting in BLT's um, Bacon, Lettuce, and Tomatoes production. That, that'd be a great title for a, a mm -hmm. theater production mm -hmm. of um, Almost Mame and Agnes and Agnes of God. Mm -hmm. Jonathan, a former student at UNCA. Jonathan, Jonathan's been directing for six years. He's directed critically acclaimed, acclaimed productions of Clybourne Park, The Glass Menagerie, uh, last year's production of The Rainmaker. Jonathan also somehow manages to act as well. Yeah. And the question, Jonathan, I'll put you on the spot and just hold up the light, pull up the mic just a little bit more, right to you. That'd be great. Um, theater, how do you spell it? T H E E R or R E? Uh, it depends on my mood for the day. The, the, I, always, I always wondered about that, but um, the, um, some people it's E R and R E. Mm -hmm. It really drives me crazy. Broad theater, I think, is R E, right? Mm -hmm. But some places, we're doing a theater production, it'll be spelled two different yeah. ways. Mm -hmm. The question to ask both of you, and I'm always interested in this, is Jennifer, you were trained as an as an actress, or now also, I, I've been reading it as an actor, right? The, the term is more generic. They use actors for both actors and actresses. Are, are you seeing that more? Yes. Yes, I am. Um, yeah. what, what's the thinking on that? Well, I, you know, I think, I think in this day and age, they're looking to take away the gender specific. Um, but I, I mean, I think either way, um, I always looked at acting period as a, a craft, um, not necessarily, um, as an art, but more as a craft. So therefore you're helping to create part of the story. That's how I look at it. So either term would apply to me. And um, the question, Jennifer, I also ask, especially when I meet somebody for the first time, and we want to think, I think, move Jonathan just a little bit to the right, maybe, if we can, is um, how did you get to become an actor? In other words, when you were a little girl, uh, where did you grow up in? I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. When you were a little girl in Tulsa, Oklahoma, did you always know you wanted to be an actor? Pretty much, yeah. Um, I started out like, I think, any 
little girl in theater, a tap dancing and doing ballet, and that morphed into getting involved in my local community theater. And I got the bug there, I guess, and just wrote it. <laughs> what was the first production you were ever in? Do you remember? Um, I was, a, gosh, I think I was a bumblebee <laughs> in my uh, grade school production. What was the production? I can't remember what it was called, but I was a bumblebee. I remember I had a yellow dress, and they gave me little antennas to wear on my head and everything. Now, Jonathan, I have an acting, I have a directing idea for you, too, and I've asked this of other directors, mm-hmm. actors, whatever, but wouldn't it be cool, we should do everybody's first production, you know, we'll, we'll have you do a production, oh, wow. and, and Jennifer as a bumblebee, okay. you know, <laughs> uh, you make, a, make a comeback, <laughs> there dig, you go. dig that up. <laughs> Same thing, too, Jonathan, and one of the things that <laughs> always amazes me about you is that not only are you a talented director, but you're also a talented actor, and, and I, I will talk about your preference in a second, but I love seeing you on stage. When you were a kid, did you have the bug, too? No, I actually did not get started till I was in uh, ninth grade and took an elective for theater because all my best friends were in theater. And my first part was a singing detective in Phantom of the Soap Opera. So, oh, really? Yeah. So, And I got addicted from that. So. And you remember that first part, too? Yeah. So Jennifer, who also directs, we want to do that, too. We'll bring back <laughs> Jonathan mm-hmm. as the singing director. That yeah. would be great. <laughs> or even better, somehow we come on the two plays. You know, mm-hmm. about a bu- singing director gets bit by a bumblebee yep. or, mm-hmm. or, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Or, do you ever write plays or no, ever anything? No, I've tried, and it's just not in my genre to do. Have you ever written anything, Jennifer? Um, I've been working on something for a while. Um, it's more to see if I can do it. Uh, but, yeah, I do. I do, I do. That, that'd be the challenge for you to see if you can take, take these mm-hmm. two different mm-hmm. kinds of plays and bring it together exactly. and uh, r- write a role for your, yourself. The question also, I'm, I'm amazed with actors especially who also direct, and both of you have done mm-hmm. that as well. Mm-hmm. And Jennifer, I'm going to have you maybe just shift a little bit to the left if we can so we can see Jonathan. There we go. That's good. Now we see Jonathan mm-hmm. on Facebook. That's perfect. Um, do you have a preference, acting or directing? Acting, definitely. But, but why so? Um, I, I like the idea of walking around in someone else's skin for a while. Um, and it gets, they're both different. You used, it's like using a different muscle group for, um, for theater. But, um, with acting, I feel it's, it's more of a personal thing and I feel my creative juices more going and I can really do I like doing the deep dive into characters. And Jonathan I'll ask you the same question mm-hmm. because again you've done both mm-hmm. I've admired your work as both an actor and a director. Do you have a preference? Um, not really. I mean I like acting and I try to at least once a year if I'm not directing it, uh, do at least one show on stage because it just keeps the craft going And but to me I always tell everybody it's my therapy either or from just the busy day, and but um, I think they're bo- both equal for me. And, and plus, as a director, you have to like what you're doing, as well as an actor, you have to like what you're, you show you're doing. <laughs> I would think that would help. Yeah. yeah, because if not, then it just makes it um, not so great experience. So, and one of the things I, I've admired about you as an actor, mm-hmm. I think I've mm-hmm. seen you on stage a little bit more than Jennifer, mm-hmm. but that um, you you play different roles, and it's mm-hmm. always a little bit different, which is yeah. I think is kind of mm-hmm. cool, mm-hmm. you know, and it's kind of. I guess that's kind of fun as an actor to yeah. stretch yourself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know. And go to div. I mean, it's like Jennifer saying, it's just to escape to be somebody you're normally not in real life. And one of my best friends, Kai Elijah Hamilton, which people know, he's always, one of his things is like you always put a piece of your personal self into a character. And I've learned that from him. And um, I think when we're on stage as actors, there's a little piece of us in that character. Because and it makes it more easier to adapt as well. And Kai's pretty amazing, too, because mm-hmm. he does acting, directing, and then he also writes yes. stuff mm-hmm. as well. Pretty talented oh, yeah. as a guy. Mm-hmm. And let's talk a little bit about Kai, not only mm-hmm. Kai, but we'll talk about Jennifer and, and you as well, mm-hmm. Jonathan, as to the, the thing you're working on right now. And you're uh, both involved in a, a play, um, A Lion in Winter. And uh, Jennifer, talk a little bit about that, if you can. Um, well, I play Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, this is a play that's based on actual historical 
um, people who existed. And Eleanor of Aquitaine is quite a fascinating character. She was probably, at her time, one of the most powerful women in the world. Um, she is, she was a queen of France, and then she annulled her husband, a Louis, and married the king of England, um, Henry. And she had these a huge swath of, of France that was hers, and it was a very valuable piece of land. It's called the Aquitaine, and it ran primarily from almost the north to the south of France in the east, no, western part of France. And so she owned that, and because of that, she had a great deal of power and influence. And to the point of where she advised both her husbands on policies and so forth and wars. And so um, in doing the play, um, you mentioned to me off there, you had seen the movie, I guess, way back when. Yes. And talk about that, because I always wonder if you're a performer, are you going to see the film again? Um, not when I'm performing the character. Um, I love Katherine Hepburn. Um, but I chose when I got the role not to watch the film again because I didn't want her performance um, influencing my interpretation of the character. And this is this is a very strong character, but there's also a lot of depth to her. She has her vulnerabilities. Um, she has a great sense of humor, as written by the playwright, and she is very mercurial. She, you know, she has a, she's always thinking, she always has a plan going on. And talk about that, Jonathan, too, your opinion of something that's been a classic movie. Mm -hmm. But remember, I haven't seen it now for a lot of mm -hmm. years, you know, and I think a lot of people haven't. Good or bad, as both director and performer, to see a, sh a movie before, after... What, what do you think? Usually, I mean, a lot of people probably um, will make references to the movie if they've never read the play. But a lot of actors, that, especially me, I will not touch anything if it's, if it's been made into a movie. I'd rather read the play first uh, compared to the movie and then watch the movie after everything's closed because <laughs> it's just easier to see where the difference is. Because as movies, you have 20 takes, and acting, <laughs> you have one. So, And then it's usually a, a condensed script, like um, play, play script compared to a movie script, where you have three times the amount of stuff, and you redo it all the time until you get that perfect take. And theater, you have that one, that once the curtain goes up, it's that performance. And I think that's probably one of the fun things that after you've done the play then, mm -hmm. then to revisit the movie oh, yeah. or something. Mm -hmm. And it's so uh, ironic, oftentimes turn a classic movie, I'll oh, yeah. play, play it something. Mm -hmm. yes. I'll show it, like, I just saw Night of the Living Dead, uh, mm -hmm. my friend Rodney Smith had directed it. Oh, okay. And mm -hmm. then they're now playing it. You know, so it's probably mm -hmm. fun to watch it a year or two years after mm -hmm. to get, get this perspective. What do you think also, something else that's come up recently, New York Times wrote about it, it's been on Facebook as well, the idea of telling people about a show before they see it, meaning not the whole thing, what do they call it, triggers or this big controversy, they give warnings to a show, you know, the mm -hmm. adult content, yeah. or you give child appropriate or, you, you know, whatever. Good or bad idea? It's, um, it's not a bad idea, but um, with theater, like, I'm an advocate for Tennessee Williams writing. You don't change anything in it. I know it's got some of uh, some of his stories have language in it. He wrote it for a reason, and I'm a real advocate of writing exactly what the playwright put in there, um, and teaching kids that this is Tennessee Williams, the history, and some of his stuff is controversial. And I think it's just um, I think people should know to a point coming to a show, what it involves. But if they have questions, they need to do research and see exactly the content of it. Because, I mean, it's... I mean, actors can pull back, but you really don't want to if you're doing Albie or Williams or something like that. You need to put the the reason they wrote it and why, why it's so successful is 
you know, the content of it. Well, and you probably both read about the controversy of Paul Quay Playhouse, you know, yes. which yes. is just incredible. Mm-hmm. They're doing a bridge version of Shakespeare, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yet people protested. Yes. So, Jennifer, the same question. Should audiences, I mean, I like what Jonathan said, they should, ideally they should research it themselves. Exactly. But, I, I yeah. As a parent. That's um, what I was going to ask a, you. As a parent, um, you know, you you want to know what your children are going to see. And I believe that in my particular, in my particular case, um, I'm knowledgeable about certain plays and therefore I can guide my children to what they should see and maybe what they shouldn't see. And also if there's something in the play that might be a little disturbing or they might question, I can advise them on that. Um, but I think, you know, as a parent, that's as a parent, but as an actor, I look at it as, um, you're, you're, ex- you're expressing what the playwright wrote. You're helping to tell the story that the playwright wrote. And I don't think that should be filtered. Um, I think that it really is up to the parents to know what is in the play and if they have an issue with it, then their children don't need to go to it if that's their choice. Um, but I don't believe that there should be on the end of the people presenting it any sort of censorship. Um, if, if anything, it should be used as a learning tool for mm-hmm. parents. How about a rating system like they have in the movies? Um, I think that... It would be all right to just say, you know, it, it, um, this for mature audiences, mm-hmm. you know, this is or something to that effect, um, giving parents a heads up of this might not be something you want your kids to see. And if they did have that rating, then the parent could take just could take the cue from that and research it themselves. And I think ACT did it very well recently yes. with Avenue Q. You know, yeah. they said, mm-hmm. this is a puppet show, not for children, mm-hmm. you know, or bring mm-hmm. the, the children home. Jonathan, I guess the, the problem with the whole idea of this, too, it can get extreme. You know, now theaters, your theater does, too, as well, put down warnings, shots are being fired. Mm-hmm. You know, so mm-hmm. that, yeah. that's one mm-hmm. thing. But I guess he can go overboard. You know, how many warnings are you going to have? Warning, we're going to have, we're going to be eating peanuts you know, on the stage. We're going to mm-hmm. be um, having, um, you know, inappropriate sexual behavior for certain. Mm. You know, I guess it can be tough. It, it it is, and I mean, like the movie. I mean, a G rating right. is not really a G rating anymore. It mm-hmm. just depends on the standards, and I mean, having a like the movie ratings. Um, I think everybody understands G, PG, rated R, et cetera. And I think it just, there's a lot of filters that fall through each of those categories. And like Jennifer saying, it should be up to the parent what they think is suitable for the child Mm -hmm. to see and uh, take that judgment. Um, And I know theaters do it too. I'm, I'm one if there's strong language you almost know what you're getting into when you go into it. It can be anywhere from a small word to a big word, and it's just that many adjectives and extremes that that G rating or R rating comes to. It just whatever um, an individual feels like is suitable. How about Lion and Winter? Who should be seeing Lion and Winter? Everybody. Um, everybody. <laughs> I mean, it's it's forever. I mean, it's probably not a G rating. I mean, it's probably around PG thirteen. You know, there's some intense moments, but I mean, it's a dysfunctional family, and we all have them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> so um, per- perfect for Thanksgiving. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's that it's that and dreadful Christmas. holiday right. dinner you go to, knowing this person knows this, and that person's going to tell on you, and it's a constant game of trying to keep it a secret, or do we just get it all out in the open? Well, you told me a, a really cute story off the air. You were talking about how they chose, Prabhat chose. Mm-hmm. Um, this lovely Thanksgiving Christmas holiday yeah. <laughs> show. Well, how did how did they choose that? Um, well, the director uh, they sent out an email basically asking for potential directors for the next year, and everybody submits a list of shows they would like to do, and they take those and take them back to the play reading committee, and then they select those directors and say, "Would you like to direct the show?" And um, I wrote down line in winter, 
and then it had a Christmas theme in it briefly and so that's their Christmas show and it's not a typical Christmas show <laughs> well I, I love it. it so it's not going to be um it's a wonderful life you know no <laughs> it's no oh, no, no. Well, but I, I like it too <laughs> but if people really want a Christmas show they should see this one because it has it, I mean it's the, it's it's no. I think the dread going home of I mean I panic myself yeah. driving home two hours <laughs> Going okay, I have to deal with family. I got to deal with family. No, but also because they have a Christmas tree. Yeah, it's a Christmas tree. Yeah, <laughs> so, and it's not supposed to come into like scene two. But I was like, the focal point's Christmas. It's going up during the beginning of the show, mm -hmm. just to keep that focal point that it is Christmas. And you know, like Eleanor's famous lines, uh, every family has its ups and downs, yes. and that's um, one of those things. It's like, yeah, it's family. You have your issues. But at the end of the day, we all love each other, and we make peace for till next year. <laughs> yep. Talk exactly. about preparing for the role, Jennifer. Again, not a um, and, and and you've taken it, and now I do recall I have seen you in a bunch of things. I saw you in Guys and Dolls. Mm -hmm. You know, big role mm -hmm. in that, great in that musical. Yeah. By the way, you have a preference musical or drama? Drama. Yeah. Drama, definitely. And talk about preparing for it again. Not a small role you have. No. Um. Like I said, um, there's a his it, fortunately for this character, there's a lot to um, to digest. She's got a lot of history, um, so you can take that information directly from history. But there's also the emotional component, and for that, um, you what I've done is I create a background um, for her for an emotional background of what has happened before, what are the events leading up to the, these two days um, during the holidays. Um, she's a very complex character. She's, um, I probably could make a good guess that in reality she was very um, always thinking two steps ahead, um, like in a chess game. Mm -hmm. She, um, if she had an equivalent for this time, very much, I think Hillary Clinton would be um, her equal in this time. Um, she's, she's highly intelligent. Um, she's she's very possessive. Um, she loves very deeply, um, and when she does love someone, she loves them with all her heart in her own way. But she's always planning and plotting and thinking. And I, you know, to get into that character, I, I, we, we have a symbol, if you will, in the play of, of the chessboard, mm -hmm. of playing chess. So I always keep, uh, every time I say a line, I keep in mind that I'm making a move on a chessboard. So that, that visual image is always in the back of my mind when I'm saying a line, because every move, everything she does, Every action, every word is a chess move for her. And talk about the process. So you were chosen, I guess Jonathan chose you to be in, in the play, mm -hmm. you did auditions. Mm -hmm. And how um, how far in advance did you know you were going to have the play? <laughs> well, now there's a story. Um, what happened was I, was, I, didn't, I wasn't auditioning for this. Um, I was uh, helping Jonathan out mm -hmm. um, with reading... Just reading for the reading Alice, um, who is the other female character, so other actresses could um, audition. And at one point, Jonathan said to me, um, "Can you stay after? And I'd like you to read with Kai." Um, and I did, and I read Eleanor, and Jonathan offered me the part, <laughs> and I said, "Oh." <laughs> Okay, and I said I need to go home and talk to, you know, my husband and because I had committed to another play, and they kind of ran concurrently, and I ended up deciding that I would take the role of Eleanor and have to drop the other role, so that's what happened. <laughs> but again, not yeah. a small role, so you, yeah. you then, once you got the role, Mm -hmm. How many weeks then did you have to get the? We had we got the play. Um, Kai and I did. Mm -hmm. 
a shortly after the audition. He he sent it to us. We didn't have the physical script in our hands. What he sent to us was in an email an attachment of the of the play, and from there, I believe both Kai and I mm -hmm. started learning our line our lines and creating the background for our characters and really working on character and going over the play and reading it over and over and over again and then we started the rehearsal process and it just sort of flew from there Jonathan how long is the process in terms of from when they get it uh, the script and then they come into rehearsal how long does that whole process take usually um, like this one we're doing in six weeks Mm -hmm. um, usually, um, and a lot of community theaters don't have the chance to take a week or two weeks to sit down and do character research and talk as a cast to get so everybody's on the same page. And um, this one we've done in six weeks. I mean, usually the director and the production team start at least two to three weeks before and um, or, a or a year before, depending on what type of show it is. So it's this one's probably taken probably around like nine weeks with like three weeks of just me and production wise, and then the six week rehearsal process with the actors. Talk about who else is in the show. Uh, well, we have Kai Elijah Hamilton who's playing King Henry. Um, he and then we have Miles Rice um, who just appeared in Ghost at Heart Theater. He's playing Prince Philip. And really, just stop you at those two plus Jennifer. I mean, those alone are worth seeing the show. I mean, what a ca what a cast yeah. you, you put together. Yeah, this is uh, it's it's a perfect cast. It's I mean, I'm fortunate to have the cast that I prefer and I want and admire and I admire every one of these actors on stage. I've worked with all of them except for two, and then um, um, Rachel um, Adams plays Alice, so she's from the Asheville area. She's worked with Kai and Miles before. And then we have Mika Parks, who was in um, James and the Giant Peach. He played James. So it's it's a lot of energy and uh, uh, different characters. They're brought to life. And I've seen this play several times. And um, every time it's different, um, it's labeled as a black comedy. It is. But um, <laughs> I, we're trying to dig a little bit deeper and bring out the all these characters have different emotions and a lot of times like in the movie version you don't see these emotions and there's there's a long line of history it's been building up for 10 years and they s try to settle it in two days talk about directing too in terms of mm -hmm. being i guess one of the toughest things you have to do as a director is when you do have auditions mm -hmm. and uh, did you have auditions for yes, this play mm -hmm. they have to choose somebody then turn somebody else down that must be tough it's tough and i always tell my uh, actors when i'm directing a show i said i am a very visual person and it might take me two weeks to cast a show because i try to get this family portrait together in my head of what looks good and i have been taught to always throw in a curveball um in a show and it uh, seems to be working out um do the unexpected at times. Um, but um, it, it's a process, but I'm usually picky about, I think Rainmaker took me two weeks to cast. Mm -hmm. This one took me around two weeks. I'm just very picky about getting that perfect picture. So. And Jennifer, the same question, and I guess you've seen both sides as has mm -hmm. uh, Jonathan, mm -hmm. in terms of a lot of people come out, a lot of talented people in Nashville especially, yeah. And to have turned people down must be tough. It is. Um, the way I've always looked at it, specifically as an actress, I had to train myself to look at it this way. Um, when you're, especially from an actor's point of view, it's always, if you really want the role, I really want to play this role. And, you know, you you get yourself psyched up for it. You go into the audition. You give it all you've got. And then you don't get the role. It's very disappointing. But as an actress, you the odds are against you. There's always ten times more actresses up for a role, up for one role, than there are actors. So you train yourself to kind of, you know, okay, I'm gonna give it all I got, but you know, I'm you know the odds are against me. So I I've trained myself that when I do get a role, I'm always surprised and delighted. 
or the example you gave this one is perhaps the best of all. Yeah, of that's all. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. This You're is not the best one. It. Yeah. John, Jonathan, if any folks want to go see the line in winter, I know I do. I'm going to see it. Real quick, the times it, it's going to be playing and uh, to get more information. Okay. Uh, we open up uh, next Friday, November 30th. We run through December 16th. Uh, Fridays and Saturday shows start at 7.30 and Sunday shows are at 3. Mm-hmm. And the website, do you know it? It's um, brevardlittletheater.org. Mm-hmm. Okay, and theater spelled? Um, R-E. Mm-hmm. Dot org. Mm-hmm. And again, I'd like to thank both you and uh, Jennifer for being my guests this yeah. is second half on the Blaine's World Show. Look forward to seeing this show. Also, I thank Amy Priznash, my producer, uh, and Zuzu Welsh who provided the music you heard at the beginning of the show and now we'll be hearing at the end. I look forward to uh, having you join me next Wednesday at 9 a.m. here on the new WPVM in Asheville, North Carolina. And it looks at least this week you're going to be able to see us on Facebook Live. Thanks, folks. <laughs>